This is Jojo Bell with AICM for Outer Experiences, and I'm here with Alex Steinman, um, and we are currently at the Covenant in St. Paul. Um, Alex, where were you born? I was born in Landsturg, Germany, um, and uh, Kaiser Slattern Air Base. Um, it's a military base um, in Germany, it's an American military base in Germany. Um, my dad was in the military, and so I was born over there. And in what year were you born? I was born in 1989. Okay. And then when did your dad return to the States with you? So my parents were 19 and 20 when they were married. And so they, uh, my dad joined the military and then they got married so my mom could go with him to Germany. And uh, I was born there maybe within the first year they were there. And then we left, uh, my mom and I actually returned home um, when I was just about two, um, we moved in with my grandparents in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, and my dad didn't come back for another year, but um, in that time that my parents were separated physically, they got divorced um, and eventually remarried later, but remarried each other later. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. And then so when you came back to Brooklyn Park, you were at, how long were you there? Uh, my mom and I lived in Brooklyn Park. Um, she was working the night shift, uh, I believe, as a social worker in a juvenile detention center. Um, and so she was gone quite a bit. Um, but we were there until I was about three and a half or so um, when we moved to Coon Rapids um, to an apartment there, my mom and I. And then my dad moved across the street from us uh, <laughs> in a townhome in Coon Rapids. And then um, when I turned... Five, I went to kindergarten in Plymouth. My parents moved in together in Plymouth. Um, and then they we moved to Maple Grove um, when I was in first grade. And I lived there all through high school. Mm -hmm. So what prompted your parents to come back to Minnesota? Like, was it their hometown too? Uh, yes, so my mom is originally from Wilmer, Minnesota, central Minnesota area. Um, her parents moved to Brooklyn Park um, before she uh, went to um, Germany, um, and so they stayed here. And then my dad's side of the family is from the St. Paul neighborhoods, um, so he grew up in on Selby Dale, <laughs> um, just about a block from where my current business is in St. Paul. Okay. So did he have roots around Rondo? He had roots in Rondo, um, Highland Park area. Um, they moved a lot um, when he was growing up, so he uh, is kind of from every neighborhood. Um, he also uh, moved to Memphis for a short period of time um, and then came back. Um, so has been kind of bounced around quite a bit in, in the St. Paul area, but um, kind of really too all over the country. Okay. And can you state again what your mother did? Uh, my mom was a... Um, Oh, so my mom, um, they met, my parents met in Moorhead, Minnesota. They went to um, college there, uh, Moorhead State. Um, and my mom went to school for social work. Um, and when she came back from Germany, um, she started working uh, right away and, and, you know, basically was like both taking care of me during the day and working at night. Um, and so, yeah, her family was, was still here. And so I think coming back to Minnesota was kind of the only choice for her at that time um, because she needed the extra support um, around, you know, taking care, of, taking care of me. Yeah. And then your father, do you know what he did when he came back for work? Uh, he worked all kinds of jobs, but I think when he came back, he ended up as a car salesman. That's what I remember most um, frequently. Um, mostly in kind of the Brooklyn Park area um, because that is like a huge car sales, uh, <laughs> like there's like a kind of ton of car dealerships right down Brooklyn Boulevard. And so he worked at a couple places there for quite a while and then ended up in the um, financial services business um, as a financial planner. Um, and then kind of from there did, um, was an insurance um, a broker um, and then owned his own insurance agency so it's done kind of a lot of different things in like the financial and like wealth building area um, but really started with like very humble beginnings as like a car salesman and a vet and trying to figure it all out um, coming back from from Germany as like a really young parent 
So, so his experience, you know, going from cars to salesman to getting into financial planning, did he ever talk to you about any obstacles he might have faced being that day in Minnesota or somewhere he was minority or his black parentage? Yes, my dad is black. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of barriers. I mean, I think people, um, you know, see black men as threats. I think we, people see, you know, black men as like not being good fathers. They see black men as not being able to achieve wealth or um, any kind of upward mobility. And so he has constantly been fighting against that. I think one thing that's really interesting about my dad is that um, like, once he got out of the projects and like once he got out of poverty like he was never going to go back like that was like he worked so hard and had a lot of you know mentors along the way to like help get him there uh get him to where he is today but i also think that um there were so many barriers coming from a, a really troubled home um you know growing up where he grew up um and you know there's a lot of people who just didn't make it out you know and who are still there and so I think you know my dad is like one of my heroes and I see him you know come against challenges every single day of just like being a black man you know and especially living now in the suburbs um you know and or has lived in the suburbs for the you know greater part of 20 years um and you know, in Minnesota, they're just extremely white, so, like, he can't go anywhere without people, you know, referencing him as, like, you know, is that a football player? Is that a basketball player? And, you know, um, and my dad's not an okay jump shot, but he is not, <laughs> he is not a celebrity, um, although maybe he'd like to think he was, but I, you know, like, one of my earliest memories of, like, living in the suburbs um, that, like, I equate with, like, living in the suburbs is, like, my dad being pulled over constantly. Um, you know, he was pulled over for, like, the tint of his windows. He was pulled over for, like, just being in existence. Um, you know, and constantly being asked the question, like, what are you doing here? You know, and, you know, as a young black girl like hearing like what are you doing here it's like well we live here like we're on our way to the grocery store we're on our way to basketball practice we're on our way to wherever the fuck we want to be <laughs> can I swear <laughs> so I I like have such vivid memories of those moments um and my dad just getting so angry in those situations and moments and like me not understanding you know what what that's about as like you know, a really young person and then kind of growing up and understanding more about it and like more about, you know, what it's like to be black in the suburbs, you know, it's just, it's a weird, it's a weird microcosm of the universe and, um, yeah. Was that one of your first memories of Negro life and how old were you? That's really one of my first memories that like I equate like, or that I remember seeing my dad go through, you know, racism or experience racism. I think as young as, like, second grade, I remember um, kids, you know, not understanding, like, where I was from or what I was. Like, that was, that's always a question of, like, what are you? Um, and I'm, I present very black. I mean, I consider myself black. Like, um, my mom is white. And my mom, because my parents, you know, they worked so hard grow, when growing up, and I've literally like, grown up with them because they were so young, um, in their young 20s, um, early 20s with a kid. I mean, I remember my parents turning 30. Like, I think that's just like such an odd thing to remember as your parents turning 30, which feels like such a formidable year. Um, and so many people now aren't having children until after they're 30. And so like, it's just an odd it's an odd memory for me. Um, so I think about, gosh, I feel so like that feels so young. Um, but I remember being in class and, um, kids who knew my mom, um, because she was like at the field trip or because she dropped me off at school every day. Like, you know, they thought I was adopted, um, because there were only two black kids in the entire school, um, in a pretty big elementary school, um, in Maple Grove. And so I remember folks asking me, 
you know, if I was adopted, when they met my dad, they were like, your dad must play for the Vikings, you know, they like automatically thought like he was Chris Carter and I was like, my last name's West. Like, <laughs> I don't know how that, you know, <laughs> that like doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, they thought my dad was like Doug West who played for the Timberwolves for a while. Like, it's just, the whole thing was so bizarre. Um, I think at the time, I don't think I thought about it as like racist. It was just like questions that kids ask you. Um, but I think, you know, over time you start to understand like the, you know, underlying, you know, Minnesota, <laughs> Minnesota nice or the underlying um, undercurrents of every of every conversation that you have as a black person in, in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. You said you watched your parents grow up when mm -hmm. you were young. Um, did you see anything um, regarding their relationship being a struggle because they were an interracial couple, like, you know, kind of aside from you growing mm -hmm. up in the Minnesota world, but did they treat your parents any differently do you, that you saw? I don't remember anybody treating them collectively differently. I'm sure they have stories of like people who had questions. I know, I, yeah, I think like the expectation was that like the your, your black father was not going to be there, you know, or the expectation was that, you know, your white mom would always be there. And the, the truth of the matter is, it's like my parents worked so much, like nobody was coming to field trips with me. <laughs> like, and that was okay. Like, you know, I think it's really shaped my own parenting of like not being so, um, uh, not feeling guilty for not like being able to, you know, do the baked goods every, you know, holiday or like, you know, forgetting Valentine's Day, <laughs> you know, like all of those types of things that come up. Like, I think because my parents were really driven individuals, but also like I knew they were working really hard so that we could have the things that we had, you know, so that we could um, grow up and, you know, have a home, like have a safe home, like feel comfortable. And so I knew those things. And so like, I didn't ever really feel that like sad that my parents like weren't super involved on like the PTA and like all of those things that were kind of expected of your white mom or, you know, not expected of your black dad. Mm -hmm. But I don't really remember any like uh, thing of them together. You know, it's interesting. I think about like how I don't remember personally them experiencing this. I know they had a hard time when they were really young, like before they even went to Germany and they were thinking about getting married, they were both super young, it was like a surprise wedding so that my mom could go to Germany <laughs> with, you know, with him. Um, and, you know, both sides of the family were not happy. Um, and I'm sure there were some racial um, undercurrents there. Um, but, I mean, I've never seen that um, from our family, you know, now that, you know, I, now that I'm an adult. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It seems like that was most of your formative years. Yeah. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about maybe if you want to, you don't have to, but to name, you know, your elementary, junior high, high school. Sure. And maybe just take us through, you know, a couple of experiences. They mm -hmm. can be positive or negative, whatever you kind of want to relate about, you know, that that experience that you remember growing up with someone who, as sure. you said, presented you there. Yeah. So my uh, I went to elementary school um, at Weaver Lake Elementary. It is, um, it was a mostly white elementary. I think I was like one of, again, two black kids to be there. Um, very few, like broadly speaking, people of color. Um, but it was, it, you know, I didn't necessarily know any different, so it just felt normal to me. Like, again, now that I have like a much broader view of the world as an adult, I think wow, I would not want my child to go to a school that looked like that. Um, but um, that was my experience. Um, that was kind of, those were the first places that I kind of like knew I was different was because I had, you know, people asking, you know, certain questions about, you know, why I looked the way I looked or I had braids one year and, you know, people called me like horse girl and like all sorts of weird things um, because I'm, 
biracial, folks called me names like Oreo, but like in jest, like nothing was ever other than like horse girl with braids, which I don't understand at all. But I think <laughs> um, other than that, which was like clearly meant to be a dig um, and, and a hurtful racist uh, phrase. But most of it, I think, was like curiosity or, you know, questions or phrases that were meant to be like fun, you know, or funny and like nobody taught children like that things were certain things are racist or certain things could hurt people um in fact I think I called myself Oreo to like fit in with a crowd you know it's like when people are saying you know giving you a nickname <laughs> you're like all I want is just to be like the same or fun or I want to be a part of this group you kind of just join in um so you know I, I think there were moments um throughout elementary school like my, my I remember this happening at, at a basketball game I played basketball like fifth grade through junior high and then I played lacrosse um, in high school but in college but in elementary school playing basketball I remember like my dad being like an assistant coach or like a sideline parent and he was like so loud <laughs> and he was always like the angry black dad like yelling at the refs and I was like god damn it dad like we can't we can't be out here like this <laughs> like, you know um and uh and like he's just so passionate and like you could just like feel like you could feel his energy like coming off of him like on the sidelines or you know when he started coaching my team um my teams at uh, traveling basketball and things but you know he would get like ejected from games for like being loud and like it wasn't necessarily that he was like angry at anybody in general but he was just get like animated and that like would freak people out and they would send him out and um you know the number of technicals my dad got as a coach like for like yelling at people it's like so funny now but at the time it was like embarrassing you know you were like oh dad like I can't believe he got kicked out of another one you know and I think it just like some at some point sometimes it like reinforced that stereotype of like you know scary black men you know and I think about it now and I'm like that sucks like you can't just have you know you can't just be animated like I would have never wanted my dad to like hide himself you know and and when I was in elementary school I was like oh my god please hide you know like as I think as anybody does with your parent but I think it's amplified for you know black kids in primary white spaces who are like oh my god I'm just trying to blend in you know um, I went to uh, most of my elementary school the districts were kind of split up um, in Maple Grove so there was you could either end up at Osseo and going to Osseo Junior High and Osseo Senior High, which were like older schools. Um, they pull from communities in Maple Grove, Osseo, and Brooklyn Park. And so it's a little bit more of a diverse school than Maple Grove, which pulls primarily from Maple Grove, Plymouth, Wyzetta, and um, some of Osseo. It just depends on like where you are in the area. Um, and Wyzetta High School like wasn't, I don't necessarily think it was really a thing then. I can't remember when it I can't remember when Wyzetta came around, but um, Maple Grove um, Junior High and, and Senior High were like relatively newer schools. Like it was like a different kind of, it was like, a, it was primarily white. Um, and so when I, I had the option to go to Osseo Junior High or Maple Grove Junior High out of elementary school because we were like right on the border. And I chose Maple Grove because my, most of my peers were going to Osseo and I wanted to try something different. And I don't think I thought about it in like the race, you know, the like, cause I think like now I would have been like, well, I wish I would have just gone to Osseo like to have like a more diverse upbringing. But I, I'm glad I experienced Maple Grove for one year because I went for, I went for seventh grade and I hated it. And then I went to Osseo for eighth and ninth grade. Um, so in seventh grade, it was, I didn't fit in. I didn't know anyone. It was like from other elementary schools that had kind of like poured into um, Maple Grove. So I felt like really alone. Um, I felt like such an odd duck. I just wanted to fit in. I changed my name in seventh grade. <laughs> I didn't tell my parents, but I, call, I told all my teachers that my name was Lexi. And like, no, I went to school with maybe, there was maybe one or two kids from my elementary school that were there. So, like, nobody knew that, like, I was Alex, 
before. And so I called myself Lexi and, um, it, God, what an identity crisis. My mom came to like parent teacher conferences one day and the teacher like pulled up my like grades and she was like, well, Lexi's doing really well in science. And my mom's like, who, I think you have the wrong kid. Who's Lexi? And she was like, no, this is Lexi West. And my mom was so pissed. She was like, what are you doing, you know? And um, I just have like vivid memories of like, it was the, you know, it was the, well, it was like 2001, it was the year of September 11th, um, was my seventh grade year, so I remember I was in math class when, when the buildings crashed. But um, the, I remember the glitter and the, you know, there was like so much like lips smackers and like you know we just like put glitter on our clothes and in our hair and my hair was curly and that was bad in those moments you know I just wanted bone straight hair and you know um I, it was like the first time that you like start to like explore sexuality and like understand that like oh like I have like boobs for a reason or like I have you know like or these are things that like other people like or like I want to dress more sexy and like I'm sitting here in like a cardigan you know like I'm like not, I'm like like the prudest like <laughs> human on earth um especially when I was really young and so like you know you're seeing all of these like kids grow up you know and like take and I just like felt like I was still like a kid you know and everybody else was like you know wearing like a sports bra and overalls and I was like I, I want to be sexy too you know <laughs> <laughs> so it was just like such a weird time I think seventh grade is the worst year anyways for people for most kids um, as they're like stepping into you know they're like hitting puberty they're getting their periods like they're just there's so much that's happening at that time let alone and then on top of that was September 11th and then on top of that was living in a really white space um, and really the only like kids of color I remember in junior high were like were other biracial kids that were like trying so hard to be white or trying so hard to be black whatever that meant to them and I just like didn't feel like I fit in anywhere so after that year um I transferred to Osseo um in eighth grade and it was like it it was amazing it was just like I fit in automatically like it was like I hadn't skipped a beat with like any of those friends like even though I didn't see them for an entire year like if you don't see people like you're just like not friends with them and you're that young like it's not like you can just like you know drive over and see them you know you don't have any control over your life like <laughs> so you know your eighth and ninth grade year is like I like was I think I was on like student council I um joined like the pops choir like I did um accelerated learning classes um because my because I transferred like I missed something but I was in like a high performance group so I ended up doing like um for an hour a day doing like individual to like I got tutored um in like a high performance class um because registration got screwed up but it was like cool because like I had my own thing and I like got to pick research projects of things that I was interested in. So like I did a whole um, like book report on like Crispus Attucks's wife and like it was just I was like such a nerd, but I could be a nerd. <laughs> I could be a nerd and I felt like cool being a nerd and like um, I just had a lot of friends and it felt it felt awesome. I love I loved Osseo. Um, I like had my first boyfriends there. Um, um, both from like uh, different backgrounds. I, I dated like a biracial uh, guy. I dated, like I'm in air quotes here because when you're in like eighth and ninth grade, like no, it's like you pass notes in school. Um, but I dated like um, a biracial um, black guy. I like dated a guy from um, Columbia. Um, and it was like, like I hadn't been exposed to like any of that growing up in elementary school. Like I didn't I didn't know anyone from like a different background um, than mine or, you know, or I, I didn't know anybody from a background that was similar to mine, I should say. Um, so that was really cool experience to like have that. Um, and then I went to um, Maple Grove Senior High because that's like where my um, boundaries laid. So I didn't have a choice to go to Osseo unless I opened and enrolled to Osseo. So then I ended up going to Maple Grove, um, which is a primarily white school, but most of the kids that I went to Osseo Junior High with 
that I was friends with in my elementary school, they all came to Maple Grove. So even though, you know, I kind of bounced around a bit, um, I still knew a lot of people um, by the time I got to high school, which was um, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Um, I fell in love with theater um, in high school. I loved choir. Um, I had a ton of friends, um, but mostly white friends. There were like six black kids in like the whole school. Um, How big was your school graduating? My graduating class was 600 people. Wow. So okay. a lot, <laughs> there are a lot of students. Um, so it was, it was a really, really big school. And I remember in uh, 11th grade, I think it was, they brought in a cultural liaison. Um, which is like so funny like we have to like help our children understand how to deal with different cultures and it's like well if you would have done this like in elementary school we wouldn't need it but <laughs> it feel or we like could continue this work like I feel like the moment that we're having right now in culture just feels very interesting because it's like so many of us or so many folks like have not done this work like growing up like we didn't have it in our history books we weren't doing anti-racist work growing up and I just think it's like our job as parents to do this work with our kids um and I don't think my parents did it a lot only because like it wasn't a it didn't feel like a problem you know when we were growing up or I don't know if my parents didn't know how to talk about it um how to talk about race we didn't shy away from conversations but like with if I asked but there was never like a talk you know there was never like a conversation about this is the experience of black folks and and here's what to expect. Um, so I think, yeah, it's just interesting. But I remember them bringing in the, this culture liaison. Her name was Miss Bakian. I've since connected with her, like, as an adult, um, which is so funny. Um, she's, like, an entrepreneur now and, like, it's out of the school systems. But she, um, she was really impactful because I think she, like, helped me realize that, like, this wasn't normal, like, being in this school, like, as the only, you know? Like, this was not normal and um, I think my parents felt kind of weird about like affinity groups like um, you know like the black student group which again was like six of us like there weren't very many of us um, but I think they felt weird about it because they didn't want it to feel like separate from everyone else like they were I think a lot of people ask this question like well isn't that like segregation in itself and like I don't think my parents were like that leaning but I think they were like well, what is this doing if it's, like, taking you out of, like, the entirety of the system and creating this, like, small group? Um, and I, I didn't find it, like, super comforting, like, at all. You know, I think part of it was, like, influence from my parents of saying, like, do I really need this? And, like, also, like, me just being, like, well, I'm friends with all sorts of folks. You know, I'm friends with everybody. And, like, you know they're not they can't come here because most of my friends are white so like they can't come to this group so it's like not that fun there's again there's only six of us so like when they did like the academic awards it's like well we all got an award like there's like six of us <laughs> so it was like my parents like laughed like in the car home they're like what kind of award ceremony is this like everybody gets a ribbon um she like you get a ribbon because you're black like I just you know I think it was just such a bizarre experience like growing up black in like a very white space and I think like watching administration like try to figure that out um I think now upon reflecting on it I'm like that is like it's a really weird way to like try to educate folks it's a really weird way to um you know try to be inclusive you know um one of I have memories too of like um gender identity being something that was um like newly being explored. I don't think anybody like had words like non-binary or, you know, even trans like that, you know, it was like a bad word when I was growing up. Um, was this early 2000s? I would say, yeah, like mid 2000s. I was in, or I was in high school from 2004 to 2007. Um, so yeah, like I remember um, the, the, there was a LGBTQ group in our, um, uh, in our school that um, they weren't allowed to do like a day of silence um, and so then that group actually sued the school district um, and it was a big news story like in Minnesota because this was a big deal like um, you know 
do you teach LGBTQ rights in high school? Like that was the question that was being asked, which just seems like, yes, <laughs> that should be like, your answer should be yes. Like if you're thinking about like, should we teach the rights of like some of the most marginalized communities? Like the answer is yes. Um, but they, um, they wouldn't and they wouldn't honor the day of silence. They wouldn't, um, there were, there were parents who were like outraged that there was even a student group, um, for LGBTQ youth. They wanted to like paint the school rock like rainbow colors for like pride day and that was like a big deal and I remember being in choir and some guys showing up um in think about this choir guys um showing up in in class with these shirts that said it's Adam and Eve not Adam and Steve that they like homemade um you know they spent time they like went to Michael's and bought like white shirts and then spent time like puff paint, <laughs> puff painting these shirts. <laughs> the irony. Um, <laughs> um, and so it was just like so bizarre. You know, I remember like them wearing those in choir and me being like, this is like not the space for that. Like we have friends who we like, like you have friends who you know are out. Like you have friends who are closeted. Like you might be gay. Like, you know, you don't know. Like maybe you do know. And like maybe this is like, your toxic masculinity like you know trying to hide that fact like it just like all of it was so hostile um so this was like when bush was in office you know like this is like it bush jr <laughs> like you know um yeah this was like the the beginning of maybe what i remember of like polarization of things um particularly on I remember that specifically around like LGBTQ um, conversations. Kind of connecting it to, you did mention early on when you did a project on Christopher Sattel's wife. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of gets that, you know, it seems like maybe you didn't get to the story of blackness that mm -hmm. much yeah. growing up in Maple Grove. So when were those first moments mm -hmm. besides like, you know, that program you were in where you got to be your own independent thing? Mm -hmm. Do you think in college you got to explore more, maybe knew more about that? So I went to the University of Minnesota and I um, was a part of MK, which is like the Multicultural Association for Excellence or something like that. I can't remember the, the full acronym, but it was like, um, you know, BIPOC folks, um, which by the way, like BIPOC was like not a phrase. <laughs> then, oh, sure. Black, indigenous and people of color. Um, we... Um, I was a part of that group coming in. I believe I got like an MK scholarship um, as a part of like my financial aid package. Um, I was a part of like a small group of um, POCs who are people of color who were um, kind of brought to different groups of um, or different different classes together. So we did like a group of like a cohort of classes together. So it was like a Black studies class, maybe a um, journalism class, and then there was something else that we took together, which was a kind of like homeroom, I guess, like where we would just like check in with each other. And it was kind of like my first experience of like being in like an education setting with other black folks and like other people of color. Um, and it was it was interesting to like learn together. Be and that feels like such a weird thing to say because I came from a city where like there were no black folks that I got to learn with and then you kind of walk into a space and it's like it's only black folks that you got to learn with. Um, so I took, it was cool because it was like this cohort of folks that got to take a couple classes together where um, you know you could have some folks to kind of lean on or like navigate challenging situations and at the university. Um, but I got involved like really early, uh, my second semester there at, at the University of Minnesota. Um, with like helping like wanting to help folks like get involved in the university because it's so big and my first even though I went to a really big school like I was able to make it small because I like participated in choir because I participated in theater I was in musicals I was student directing I was like doing all the things um and um when I got to college it was like none of that mattered you know <laughs> like all of a sudden you're like nobody and you're like oh god like I have no friends I don't know anybody I like got really shy like my freshman semester my first freshman semester which like felt really weird to me I was like oddly like attached to my boyfriend at the time who's like you know now my husband but like I like 
I just wanted to like follow him around and like do what he was doing. Well, he was like also super boring and like did, <laughs> didn't have a ton of friends. So it was like, I just like hung out with him. Um, and so I kind of started to like do my own, like uh, in my second semester of freshman year, like I got a job as a um, College of Liberal Arts ambassador, like helping bring new students or recruiting new students to the college and giving tours and helping them, like pe helping people understand how to get involved because I felt like I hadn't done a good job of getting involved right away. And it really like was depressing, like it was it was bad. Um, but I took some Afro Studies classes my first year um, through that MK program, which were really cool to like dig into, you know, the literature of Angela Davis and um, Alex Pate, who's at the university and. Um, um, there were just, there were so, there were so many like brilliant black folks that like, I didn't have a black teacher until I got to college. Um, there's that meme that goes around, you know, it's like, how old were you when you had your first black teacher? And it's like, never, like college. Um, and it was amazing to like hear, hear from them, like hear their struggle. I don't think my dad, you know, really talked about his like, uh, experience growing up with me until like I didn't have like a deep understanding of his experience growing up until I was like out of college you know when like maybe I just like understood it better or maybe he tried to explain it before and I just like didn't quite understand it until you kind of get a little bit older and can understand what the black experience is um from multi multiple levels you know because um, everybody contains like multitudes right my dad grew up in poverty and you know now doesn't live in poverty but like has family that still live in poverty so like you're always still attached to it like you don't ever leave like how do you how do you I think like those are the questions I started to like be able to explore mm -hmm. and, and just by way of that, yeah where did he grow up did he grow up in Minnesota too he grew up mostly in St. Paul oh. yeah in St. Oh, Paul okay. neighborhoods yeah no that's that. okay <laughs> that's yeah. okay um so I think like um I think I really started exploring, you know, who I was. I think what was really comfortable to me in um, in college, I remember trying to go to the Black Student Union and like, you know, participate in Black Student Union activities. And I just like never really felt like I was that, like I fit in there, like again, as a biracial person, like I think, especially a biracial person um, who grew up with a level of privilege and also like, you know, is lighter skin, and then you, like, go into a, a group of, like, incredible black people, and you, like, I just, I felt very intimidated by that, and was, like, oh my god, this is, like, Mecca, like, this is amazing, there's so many black people here, <laughs> you know, um, but I didn't, like, relate to anybody on, like, a, uh, you know, experience side, because, you know, it, it felt like most people had grown up, like, maybe with two black parents or who are more connected to their black side of their family or were lived in black neighborhoods or or lived in multicultural neighborhoods they at least had like experience with other cultures and like i really didn't um growing up um and so that was a really huge whiplash for me in in college and i think i was like a little bit like woe is me for a little bit about it because i was like god like i missed out on a lot like i don't relate to folks who like look like me and I've wanted that for so like I wanted to be around like black people for a long time and I just couldn't relate um and I think it took me a while to like really unpack that and like understand understand what like what it is to have like privilege as a black person and what it is to um what it means to like what it means to like be black like you know I'm like a total black nerd like I just I, like I'm a total nerd and like growing up like being a black nerd was like not a thing you know it was like Urkel like that was that was like what you had in your head as a black person who's like nerdy um but there's like a whole like black nerd culture like <laughs> yeah. um so you think those things that we associate with, with white people we can't you know associate with black people things like liking comic books mm -hmm. stuff like that. yeah things like you know enjoying school like things like getting good grades like things like you know um I, I don't know like I played lacrosse like the whitest sport you could ever play yeah, besides our beloved hockey, right? <laughs> yeah right I mean it's practically hockey but <laughs> um you know it's hockey in a skirt and like um I loved it and I love the physicality of it I love the finesse of it I love um, I loved every bit of it, but 
you know, there were, there was one other black girl on the team and she was also like, from what I, you know, I felt like we were both like bending ourselves to be, you know, more aligned with our like white teammates, um, you know, or other white students. And maybe she didn't feel that way, you know, maybe that's just like who she was. But I also just feel like I've always been like able to code switch to like, I don't know, I feel like a chameleon. Like I like, what do you want me to be today? <laughs> you know, um, I think some of that just like comes from my like achieving nature like I'm like and you know on every like Enneagram on the strengths finders like I'm an achiever I'm a maximizer I'm a person who like likes to be liked I'm a woo in in the strengths finder which is like wooing others winning others over um and so some of that is all just like that's all to say like I think I just like wanted to be liked by anyone and then when I like knew that there were groups of black people that were hanging out together like that was just like so foreign to me getting to college and being like I've never seen other black people like in like this many black people in a room before and I wanted to like be a part of that so bad um and so you know but I also like I just wanted like anyone to like me at that point and so I think I was just like bending to you know whoever was in front of me at the moment um in college and that you know I think that was like really formidable years of like learning who I was and like navigating like I am actually this type of person and like this is what I like to do and I'm proud of it and it doesn't matter like if I'm black or white or whatever like this is just like what I what I love um and I think it's really like the moment those are like the moments where I think coming out of college and more recently like out of the advertising industry um where I just feel like unapologetically black and like this is like my black and like I'm black I'm black because I'm black. <laughs> I'm black because I'm black, and this is what I like. <laughs> yeah, and this is what it looks like. Yeah. Do you want to give us some background on your, you know, your career? Mm, sure. So I, um, you know, as an adult, I was in advertising. I, um, after the University of Minnesota, I went to the journalism school um, and graduated, went right into um, uh, public relations. That was, like, my degree. Um and so started in PR, but it was really stuffy, and I really liked the creative nature of advertising, and so moved from Carmichael Lynch to Fallon, and was at Fallon for about six years um, before uh, leaving to start my own company, The Coven, which is a co-working space for women, non-binary, and trans folks. So um, kind of over the peri that period of time, I think like that's really, really where I like started to find my voice. Um, college feels so far off and like a blur and very messy um messy in terms of like it was all about like I just wanted to get through college like I just wanted to like get through it and get a job like I love work like I've worked since I was 13 like in my dad's insurance office like I've just like always had a job um worked in catering I was like in retail I, I'd done it all um and I loved, loved, loved um, working because <laughs> I loved having money. <laughs> I loved being able to like do the things I wanted to do um, and, and not rely on my parents. Like that was something like I never ever wanted to do is like rely on my parents for money. Um, and so, you know, I paid for most of college with my, um, you know, with writing, with like scholarship, merit scholarships. Um, so my, uh, in advertising my experience was like exactly like Mad Men like you know it's exactly how it's portrayed on the TV you know it's like it's a boys club um, you know I straighten my hair like I like you know dress a certain way again this is like me like trying to like get everybody to like me in a certain way and it's very white I was like the only black person in the agency um, one of one of two maybe for a while and then one of three for a while um, like I can like picture all three of us because like that's all there was <laughs> Um, and it was, it, you know, there were just so many like coded moments, um, you know, so many like microaggressions, so many, um, you know, I remember a client, um, like a pitch happened and there were like five white clients and one black client and they were pairing people in the agency and I didn't even work on the pitch and I got put on uh, like one-on-one -on -one with the black guy who was on the other team and I was like you don't like I told he like came and sat with me and he like knew exactly what happened like we both had this like knowing look in our eyes we were like we're together because we're black um 
And I told my boss, and he was like, you know, I just, I don't even see color. And, like, the number of times I've heard that phrase, I mean, I could, if I had a dollar, I could, like, I could pay off my husband's student debt. You know, like, we, like, we just, like, that's just what we heard all the time. Um, You know, I don't see color. It's the, you know, it's the creative idea that matters and blah, blah, blah. Like, it's just, it's all bullshit. Um, And after a while, we, I, like, you know, started to, like, step into, like, that was maybe the first time that I, like, spoke up for myself and was, like, this is not cool. Um, you know, I, I had two babies over the course of the time that I was in um, advertising, um, and I think, like, with each kid, <laughs> like, like, I just got louder and, like, more um, defensive of myself and, like, more unapologetically black and, like, more, like, this is who I am and, like, I'm loud and I'm also, like, I'm, I'm going to fight for me. I'm going to fight for my people. I'm going to fight for the folks who can't speak for themselves because they're too afraid for their jobs. And, like, frankly, this job is, like, not worth, you know, like, if you fire me because, like, I'm outspoken, like, come at me. You know what I mean? And, and so, like, I just started, like, you know, speaking up when I just saw stuff that was broken, you know, or was built um, not for women or not for people of color or not for black folks and so like you know when I right before I went on maternity leave we um put in this um new phase return plan so like when you came back from maternity leave you could have six weeks from like the last day of your maternity leave to six weeks after that to like start to like phase back into work so you could have you know two weeks where you're going to work from home and then you're going to like try test daycare you can like do whatever you want for those six weeks to try to like get your way back up to 100 percent in the office but you're getting paid full um and you know i told like the um i kind of built this plan and then talked to the um director of account planning or account services which is the area I was in and he got praised when they rolled it out and they were like this guy I won't say his name this guy came out and like you know developed this amazing plan we thank him so much for his efforts and like really championing women and I was just like fuck you like that was like you know like how is this even possible you know, there were, there were many of us behind it, not just me, but they were all women and all folks who have like been through maternity leave. I called up like other agencies and were like understanding what their return to work program was. And like, we have to do better. I worked hand in hand with the, our talent director to like build the plan. And then when they rolled it out, I didn't even get mentioned. Like none of us got mentioned. It was so embarrassing to like put your effort into something and then see somebody else get the credit for it, especially a white dude. Um, And it was just like, you know, par for the course, fine. You know, like this just happens all the time. And I was like, this is bullshit. Like I'm not doing this anymore. And so, you know, as I like grew in that um, organization, um, it just, it became clear, like we weren't going to change the industry in our lifetime. And so I just decided to like work with uh, some other incredible women in the industry who were also fed up enough and we started our own business. Mm-hmm. And you started the coven. We started the coven. Now yeah. two locations in yes. Minneapolis and St. Paul. Yeah, they're just reopening after the coronavirus. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And my final question, and you can add anything you want. Um, so do you see some of those ties of maybe not forming your identity and forming it later and some of those early experiences mm-hmm. in the real world? Do you see that influencing how maybe you run the coven or, mm-hmm. or make you start the coven? Or just in even your personal life, like how do you think that shaped you, that experience of the black and most employed? We talk about race in my house every day, every single day. Not like before George Floyd, before the coronavirus, before Tamir Rice, before, you know, before all this stuff, like, before all of it, like, we we talk about race every single day in my house because we didn't when I was growing up. And I don't think it's, like, a knock on my parents. I think it was just, like, a knock on the era, a knock on the system, a knock on education in general. Um, but I know the schools aren't going to do a good job of this. Um, I know they're going to try, but I know they're not going to do a great job of this. Um, and I think it's important that my kids at like the ages that they're at right now, they're almost four and 
my son will be six in the fall. My daughter's four. And we're about, like, they're at this age now where they have questions. They have words to put to how they're feeling or what they're seeing or, you know, they can sense my energy. They know why I'm sad or when I'm sad or they know all of that um, and they can sense it. And so I feel like really strongly about being open about those conversations, conversations about mental health, conversations about being black, conversations about, you know, what does your black look like, you know? Um, and I'm committed to making sure that, you know, they are surrounded by love and, you know, many people who look and don't look like them because that's what the world like really looks like. And it was such a shock to go to a university in Minnesota and feel shocked in my own state, you know, like that, that's not right, <laughs> you know? Um, and I grew a lot from that experience, but being in Maple Grove, like, I think, I can't imagine sending my kids to a school like that and not, like, sometimes maybe you don't have a choice, right? Like, that's where you go, that's where you planted your roots, that's where you're going to school, like, whatever. But, like, the fact, like, I can't imagine, like, not talking about the things that need to be talked about, um, like race and, like, social justice and, like, you know, being black in America and black history and, um, you know, famous black literature and uh, there's just so much that I felt like I had to catch up in my, catch up on in my 20s um, and I'm glad that I did and I'm still, like, I feel like I'm always doing the work, like, the work is never done, like, you can never, like, read all everything, you know, so, like, you just have to, like, keep absorbing um, and I'm excited to, like, continue absorbing and, like, sharing that immediately with my kids and, like, you know, I was, reading a book um, book by Grace Lee Boggs the other day and like reading it out loud to my daughter like the the new what is it the new American Revolution was her book in um, 2011 and like my daughter was like what are we reading and she's four years old she's like what is this but um, you know like you see like my, my kids like acting out protests with their Legos like <laughs> it's so perfect um, I just think it's so important to like raise, raise children to like be a part of the revolution and um, I think you know, those are some of, like, the main reasons why, um, you know, that's, like, the main, the, the, re, the, because I lived in Maple Grove, I think, like, it's why I'm so, like, vocal with my children, so vocal with our, vocal with my family, um, and why I'm, like, unapologetically black today. Well, I really want to thank you for joining me and adding a voice to this project. Thank you.